Welcome to Under the Hood, the faculty position series. May these tips propel you along your journey. Welcome back to part six of the faculty position series. Now we're discussing the offer and negotiation stage. Congratulations. This is a big step and it's a wonderful accomplishment. So after you actually sign your offer letter, you can officially call yourself a professor. Congratulations. So let's jump into the process um, of receiving your offer and how you're going to go about getting through the negotiations. So the process is not as torturous as you might think. You know, this isn't a haggle. It isn't a high stakes negotiation. Um, usually, um, in, especially in public school systems, the process is pretty uh, consistent for all hires, okay? So the first thing that happens is you'll get an unofficial offer by phone, meaning your department chair is probably going to call you up and say, hey, we've got good news. You're the person that we're putting forward for campus approval for the offer. And all of the emotions will flow. Um, I cried <laughs> when I received this call a couple times. Um, it's a great feeling, and so you should be proud of yourself. So now comes the work. You'll actually have to go through and figure out what you need and how much salary you need, and that's a part of the negotiation phase, which I will talk about in detail. Finally, after you and your chair have agreed on what you need and what you'll be getting as far as a startup, you will receive the official offer letter by probably by email on letterhead um, with the specific details of your hire and your startup offer that is enclosed in the, in the letter. And if you approve of those, um, things, then you can endorse the letter, sign off on it with an electronic signature and send it back. And boom, that's it. So let's jump into the details of the negotiations. So negotiations should be pretty uneventful. It's two to three communications with your chair. They will send you um, the basic outline of what you should do in the next phase. They'll say, all right, um, we can offer you X, Y, Z in resources. We can make a starting salary offer of X, Y, Z. Can you please compile a list of your needs? Okay, so let's start. For your salary, they will give you a base salary um, based on your nine month contracted salary rate. Okay, most professors are paid for nine months of their effort, all right? The salaries are usually pretty generous, so you really can't tell that you're actually not being paid the entire year. But if you want to uh, understand how much you could potentially be, be making with the extra three months of summer salary that usually comes from external grants or your startup, all you have to do is multiply by 12 and then divide by nine. So the multiplier is... Uh, 12 ninths. So you're dividing your nine month rate by nine so that you can get um, that monthly rate and then you multiply by 12. So that should give you an idea of your um, total potential earnings. Now you should be comfortable with your nine month rate um, and being able to cover all your expenses with the nine month rate. And I usually consider anything above the nine month rate in terms of seller, summer salary as just a bonus. Um, so you really should set your eye on negotiating the nine month rate. The offers for private schools are gonna be a little bit higher than those of public schools. So I would not do an apples to oranges comparison if you've heard that your friends got hired at this private Ivy League school and they're making this much money, um, it's a little bit less in the, the public sector for academia. Um, specifically for the UC system, there is a step ladder system where in general, people are hired at 
step two or step three, depending on their postdoctoral experience. And there's usually um, little wiggle room in terms of how much you can negotiate around those set salary tables. The UC salary tables can be found online, as well as the historical data of faculty and staff salaries and student salaries. So anybody that's employed by the UC system, their salaries should be available online, and there's usually a two-year lag. You also need to be careful about interpreting those um, salaries online because they could, uh, there is, uh, changes related to cost of living increases that have gone across the UC system and there's other internal changes that you might not be aware of but if you are if you have an offer from the UC system and you have a friend that works in the system they should be kind enough to explain to you how all that works and give you an idea of what you should be paid now you should consider the cost of living differences from where you live currently and where you're planning to move to and you need to make sure that you can afford to live there. Um, and you should express that concern to your hiring chair and see if there is um, a way that they can address your concerns in, in an equitable manner. Also, I always encourage uh, candidates to review any public data on salaries and make sure that you're being paid fairly. Okay. Now, the next part of your negotiation is compiling a list of your needs. And I have listed the different categories of needs that you will be inquiring about. Um, first, there's equipment needs. So what big equipment do you need? And equipment is considered um, things that are greater than $5,000 in, in unit price. So these are going to be your gas chromatographs, your mass spectrometers, your, your fume hoods, um, things like that. So you'll want to get a quote for those if you already have it, but um, inc and include the direct costs in your, your startup uh, package. So usually what I do is I compile all of this information in my own version of an Excel spreadsheet and then I send that spreadsheet over to my hiring chair. The next thing you can do is add student support needs. So um, this is usually in units of student years, so grad student years. Um, the, usually your, the cost associated with a graduate student could be 50 to 75K per year, and you can get that rate from the hiring uh, chair if you want to be accurate but usually the student support is consistent across the board for all hires usually everyone gets about two to four years of student years of graduate PhD student support they will not give you funding for a master's student unless usually in STEM so if you're in a design or humanities uh, department I can't speak to that I've you may get master's support over there, but generally over in STEM, you're only going to get startup support for PhD students. Um, Postdoctoral support, research staff support, um, lab manager support may be on the table in certain cases, and so you're going to want to include that in there if you need that. Um, some general advice I've heard over the years is you may want to hire your lab manager for the first three years to help you ramp up. And I will have a video about your first year ramp up and the implications of your staff composition and how easy or how difficult the ramp up will be. The next you wanna put in an estimator for the supplies, consumables, and any new furniture that you'll wanna purchase. Professional development. There may be a small allotment for travel for you to go to leadership workshops, you know, uh, faculty career development workshops um, usually that's around 10k lab space you should let it be known in square feet about how much lab space you're gonna need and so at UCR the lab space is about 600 square feet and at Berkeley the spaces can range from 300 to X square feet so it just depends on where you are 
Um, during your on-site interview, you can actually ask some of the faculty how big their lab spaces are to give you an idea of what to ask for at this stage. Um, also make sure the uh, lab infrastructure is in is present in the lab that you you will eventually inherit. Um, inside of your offer letter should be the number of the room of your lab as well as your your office space. So good offers already go ahead and determine where your lab space is going to be, the building, and so forth. So you don't want to leave this up to chance and you don't want to leave this out of your offer letter because if it's not in writing, it, it didn't happen. The next thing that'll show up in your list of needs is a course release. Usually the standard for course releases is the same for every hire. In general, you get to uh, be off from teaching in your first semester or your first quarter. Um, I recommend that you have a semester or a quarter that is adjacent to a summer to be off. So if you're hired to start in the July 1st, you'll want to have the fall off. So that gives you six consecutive months of time to ramp up. Or you can jump right in if you're hired um, August 1st. You can go through the year, teach a couple classes maybe, or teach one class in the fall, and then you have the spring off, and that rolls consecutively into your summer semester. And so you have the latter half of the year for, for ramp up because the fall is usually inundated with trainings and you don't get much done during your first fall anyway. Modified leave. If you are expecting a child when you're um, onboarding or around the time when your start date is, you can go ahead and ne negotiate that you'll have modified leave at the beginning of your pre-tenure career um, to make sure that all of those details are worked out so that you can have like a, some comfortable expectations for starting if you need to go on maternity leave or any other kind of modified leave. Lastly, your housing and moving costs should be um, explicitly stated in the offer letter. When it comes to housing, um, some institutions will give you a stipend that will help you with down payment costs. You should know that in the state of California, housing stipends are tax considered impounded income. So it will show up in your earned income, but the taxes will get um, taken out of that stipend. So if you're given a 50K housing stipend, uh, whatever your effective tax rate is, that will be taken out of the stipend upon entry into your bank account. So take that into consideration when you're negotiating your housing uh, allowance, if one is provided. Moving costs usually are about $10,000. These are also impounded uh, income, okay? So this moving cost, um, the money actually never gets into your account, but the taxes leave. So just be mindful of the, the tax laws around moving when you are accepting an offer for California specifically. So the next step is formulating your official offer letter, um, which will have the provost's uh, header information on it. So this offer letter is generated from the provost's office in most cases. And it should include everything that you and your chair agreed to have in the negotiation, agreed to have in your startup request um, that you negotiated. So um, I recommend that you take this draft, um, wait 24 to 48 hours, and send it to a trusted advisor. Make sure that all of, or rather you should have uh, reviewed your negotiations and your startup request with a trusted advisor, but you'll also want to have them review your offer letter as well. All right, once you feel comfortable with what's in the offer letter, then you sign it and it's official. So congratulations on your offer and congratulations on transitioning to tenure track facultyhood. So this is an exciting time. You've successfully navigated three to four hiring steps. You've gone through negotiations and you're finished. 
you have officially entered into tenure track facultyhood. So be sure to celebrate this amazing accomplishment. Thank you for your attention. If you have follow-up questions, please put them in the comment section below. And I'll see you in the next part of the series where we talk about what happens when you start this, uh, this exciting job.